So we're reading about the meeting of Savitri and Satyavan. She has seen him standing there in the forest and suddenly she realized that this is the one she's looking for and she stops the chariot. So I'm starting to read from line 147. And Satyavan looked out from his soul's doors and felt the enchantment of her liquid voice fill his youth's purple ambience and endured the haunting miracle of a perfect face. Mastered by the honey of a strange flower mouth, drawn to soul spaces opening round a brow, he turned to the vision like a sea to the moon and suffered a dream of beauty and of change discovered the aureole round a mortal's head, adored a new divinity in things. His self-bound nature foundered <coughs> as in fire. His life was taken into another's life. The splendid, lonely idols of his brain fell prostrate from their bright sufficiencies as, it, as at the touch of a new infinite to worship a Godhead greater than their own. An unknown, <coughs> imperious force drew him to her. Marveling he came across the golden sword. Gaze met close gaze and clung in sight's embrace. A visage was there, noble and great and calm, as if encircled by a halo of thought, a span, an arch of meditating light, as though some secret nimbus half was seen. Her inner vision still remembering new a forehead that wore the crown of all her past. Two eyes, her constant and eternal stars. Comrade and sovereign eyes that claimed her soul. Lids known through many lives, large frames of love. He met in her regard his future's gaze, a promise and a presence and a fire, saw an embodiment of aeonic dreams, a mystery of the rapture for which all yearns in this world of brief mortality, made in material shape his very own. This golden figure given to his grasp, 
hid in its breast the key of all his aims, a spell to bring the immortal's bliss on earth, to mate with heaven's truth our mortal thought, to lift earth hearts nearer the eternal's sun. In these great spirits, now incarnate here, love brought down power out of eternity to make of life his new undying base. His passion surged away from fathomless deeps. It leaped to earth from far forgotten heights, but kept its nature of infinity. We'll go this way round. Gumson, you'll begin. We're on page 396, uh, line 147. And, and yes. Mm. And Satyavan looked out from his soul's doors and felt the enchantment of a whole liquid voice, filled his used pu purple. purple, ambience, and endure. The haunting miracle of her perfect face. Thank you. So we had read about Savitri seeing Satyavan. Now Satyavan looks out, the, the chariot stops and he sees her. He looks out and he's not just looking out from his physical eyes, he's looking out the doors of his soul have opened. Mm. And uh, she didn't actually speak, she gave a cry just, no? And that was the last thing that we read last time, that uh, the, the shock of recognition uh, moved in her breast and cried out like a bird. This is what he's heard. He, um, he feels the enchantment of that voice, that liquid voice. There's something so beautiful, it's like the voice of a bird. He felt that enchantment fill the whole uh, atmosphere of his life, his youth's purple ambience. Purple, of course, is a color, it's that rich, um, mixture of red and blue and um, we find in the poem that Sri Aurobindo always associates this with the, the, uh, the life being, the emotional being, particularly the higher emotional being. So it's as if he has already this atmosphere, now her her atmosphere fills it and he sees the haunting miracle of a perfect face. This is something rare and special uh, to, to see a, a, a really very, very beautiful face. No? And um, that face may stay with you. Lakshmi. Mastered by the honey of a strange flower knife, drawn to stone stages, opening around the world, he turned to the vision like a sea to the moon, and suffered a dream of beauty and of change. Discovered the aureole. The aureole, yeah. Aureole around the mortal's head, adored a new divinity 
Mm. So he's mastered, he's overcome by the sweetness of this mouth, this mouth that's like a flower. It's strange and new to him and he's attracted. It says if he sees opening up around her, her brow, her forehead, soul spaces. There's some kind of spiritual atmosphere there. So he turns to this vision the way that the sea is attracted by the moon. This is a, a known fact you now that the, the moon's gravity uh, attracts the waves of the sea. So it's an, a, a kind of power of attraction acting and he suffered. It said he endured, no? Mm -hmm. To see something perfectly beautiful. It can be almost too much to bear, you know? It begins to be painful. And in the same way now, this is, it's almost too much. This uh, dream that comes to him when he sees Savitri, this dream of beauty and of change. And he discovers, but it must be the first time he's seen something like this, the aureole around a mortal's head. An aureole, it's that halo that artists paint around the, the head of a, a saint or a divinity. You know, it reflects something that perhaps we can really see if the subtle sight is opened up a little bit, that there's a, a, a light shining around the head. He sees something like that. And he feels worship and adoration for a new divinity in things. This, this beauty seems to be something n new and divine. So this is love at first sight, you know, a special kind of very, very powerful uh, recognition of beauty and an attraction. Martin. A self-bound nature founded as in fire. His life was taken into another's life. The splendid, lonely idols of his brain fell prostrate in their bright sufficiencies as at the touch of a new infinite to worship a God greater than their own. Mm, thank you. So, what happens when we fall in love? Our self-bound nature, our limited personality opens up to another being, no? He says this Satyavan self-bound nature, his sense of self foundered. This is a word that we use of um, a ship that gets wrecked you know, and it's sinking. So it's as if he, all his uh, self-bound being is uh, destroyed, burned up. In, in this fire, as if in fire, and his life was taken into another's life. He feels a kind of union happening. And there he's been living alone in the forest. Um, he's, we, we had a brief description of how he responded to nature and the power, the divinity in nature. But all that has been lonely, these figures of divinity that have occupied his mind, his consciousness. Now, all those images, they fall prostrate. They bow down they, in, the, in the Indian way, uh, putting them, prostrating themselves from their bright sufficiencies. They had been proud and bright and divine in themselves, now they prostrate as if they've been touched 
by a new kind of infinity and they feel compelled to worship a, a Godhead, a divinity greater than their own. It's a kind of automatic surrender. Emily. An unknown imperial force drew near to her. Marveling, he came across the golden sword. Gaze met close gaze and clung in sight's embrace. Thank you. So there's this power of attraction, this unknown imperious force. This has to do with imperial power, the power of the emperor, the supreme, the earthly power, no, something that can't be resisted. Imperious force. He feels compelled to move towards her. So in a state of wonder, marveling, he walks towards her across the golden sward. The sward is the grass, that lovely grass on the edge of the forest and it's in full sunlight so it looks golden, it's shining golden. And uh, the two of them gaze at each other. They, they are looking into each other's eyes. Gaze met close gaze and clung in sight's embrace. It's a kind of embracing through the eyes. So, uh, what we read next, I think this is how Savitri sees Satyavan. Shiv, yeah? The sage was there, noble and great and calm, as if encircled by a halo of thought, a span, an arch of meditating light, as though some secret nimbus was seen, her inner vision still remembering me, her forehead that wore the crown or the past, two eyes, her constant and eternal stars, comrade and sovereign eyes that claim her soul, lips known through many lives, large frames of love. Mm -hmm. So what she sees is this face, Satyavan's face, noble, great, calm, and she also sees something like a halo, a halo of thought. He's a young man, but he has this look of seriousness about him, high seriousness, and the brow is a span we can have the span of an arch, of a bridge, or in a, in a church. No? This seems to be an arch of meditating light around the forehead. We see that Shobindo often mentions this, uh, the significance of the brow and the forehead and what is that appearance, what is it uh, conveying. No? And she, it's as if she sees this through a cloud. A nimbus is a cloud. That's the normal way in which we use the word. It's a special kind of cloud, a very cloudy cloud. Um, misty, yeah? So it's as if she's seeing him through this uh, cloud of light. And when she sees this, her inner vision, still remembering, knew, she recognizes that same forehead that swears the crown of all her past. This has been the ruler of her past lives. And these eyes that she sees are her constant and eternal stars. They have always been her guiding lights. They've been comrade eyes, they have been close, and they have been 
sovereign eyes. Those eyes have ruled her, ruled her soul. These eyes have lids, eyelids, that she has this strong feeling of recognition. They're known through many lives and they are framing that love that flows out to her through the eyes. So, from Savitri's point of view, she remembers all the past contacts they have had. No? Do you like to read, sir? No? You're reading something else. All right, Joel, yes. We met in her regard, his future's gaze, a promise and a presence and a fire, so an embodiment of eonic dreams, a mystery of the rapture for which all yearns in this world of brief mortality, made in material shape, is very own. Hmm. So, Savitri recognizes something from the past. He sees in her promise of the future, a promise, a presence, a fire, an intensity. And he sees in her an embodiment of aeonic dreams, as if for eons and eons, so many space, uh, vast spaces of past time, he's been dreaming of this. And now these dreams get embodied in a human figure in front of her, him. And uh, these aeonic dreams, he says, uh, Sri Aurobindo says, they represent a mystery of the rapture, the intense delight for which everything is yearning in this world, this world of brief mortality, we only live for a short time, but all of us are carrying in us this longing. We feel that there should be bliss, there should be intense delight. And now when he sees this figure of Savitri, he feels that that delight for which everything in this earth is yearning is uh, made in material shape, his very own, that he will be able to possess that delight. <coughs> Patricia. This golden figure given to his grasp hid in its breast the key of all his aims, a spell to bring the immortal bliss on earth. To mate with heaven's truth our mortal thought. To lift earth hearts nearer the eternal sun. Mm -hmm. So he sees her as a golden figure, and it's as if this figure has come to him as a gift, as if he will be able to take hold of it. And he feels that it hides in its heart, in its breast, the key to unlock everything that he has always wanted to do, all that he has longed for, as if it holds a spell, an, a magic spell, an enchantment that will bring to the earth the bliss that belongs to the immortal spheres, to the higher spheres, the heavenly spheres of consciousness. So that uh, spell would allow the truth of heaven to mate with, to unite with our mortal thought, our human way of thinking, and will help to lift all the hearts of all things on earth nearer to that sun, that great sun, of the eternal being and power 
and presence and love. Mahalingam. These great streets now incarnate here. Love brought down power and toxic energy to make of life is new and dying days. Mm. So in these great spirits, Savitri, Satyavan, now they are here meeting in human bodies, incarnate, and in them love brought down a power out of eternity. Sri tells us that the power of human love is a, a derivative, it has come from divine love, a power out of eternity. And in these two special spirits, these great spirits, this power out of eternity, this new kind of love, will make life here the, the basis for a higher kind of love. His, this is love, the God of love. And it's the same in the next uh, sentence. Do you like to read? Okay. His passion surged away from fathomless deeps. It leaped to earth from far forgotten heights, but kept its nature of infinity. Mm, so this is the passion of love. It's coming like a, up like a wave from the bottom of the ocean, something like a tsunami. And at the same time, it's coming down from above. It leaps to earth from far forgotten heights. <coughs> it's coming up like a wave. It's coming down. But it's, as it comes, this passion, this intensity of love, it keeps its nature of infinity. It doesn't become limited and small. This mm -hmm. passion is the love. This passion of love, yes. Yeah. You like to read? Yeah. Um, on the tomb bosom of this all oblivious floor, although as unknown beings we seem to meet, our lives are not aliens, nor as strange as joy. Me to each other by a causeless cause. Thank you. So now he's making a general statement. He's shown us this meeting of Savitri and Satyavan and the powerful attraction, the love that awakes in them. And now he's going to tell us something that <coughs> is generally true. He says, although we see, may seem to meet as unknown beings, we meet people, we might meet new people more or less every day. Um, sometimes we have the impression that a meeting is very, very significant for us. No? So we may seem to meet as unknown beings as we're moving about on the dumb bosom of this earth. He says this earth is oblivious. It has forgotten its origin. It's not aware of all the superphysical significances, no? It, he says, our lives are not aliens, and they don't come together really as strangers. They are not moved to each other by a causeless force. It's not just an accident that we meet this person or that person. There is some prior connection which allows us to meet. Mm -hmm. Sergei? The soul can recognize its answering soul across divided time and on life souls. Absorb, red traveler, join it recovers, familiar splendors in an unknown face, and touch by the warning finger of sweet love. It thrills again to an immortal joy, bearing a mortal body for delight. Yes. So this can happen 
in a meeting, the soul can recognize its answering soul, its corresponding soul, across dividing time. It may, may have been divided for a long time before they meet on life's roads again. They've been absorbed, wrapped travelers on life's roads, going on, not thinking, not expecting anything. And suddenly, turning, it recovers, it finds back again, it rediscovers familiar splendors, wonderful things that are suddenly like a recognition, something familiar. Even though the face is unknown, it's never been seen before in this life consciously. But then what happens? It's as if love touches us with a swift warning finger. Then the soul thrills again. It thrills again with that immortal joy that now it sees here on the earth wearing a mortal body, a body that is perishable, that will die, but it's put on that mortal body for the experience of this meeting, for delight. Mm -hmm. There is a power You can read the next two lines. To live, to love our signs of infinite things. Love is a glory from eternity, eternity's fears. Hmm, yes. So two different things. There's a power within, within each of us that knows more than our knowings, our normal knowings with our surface consciousness. Within us there's something that knows much more than that. We are greater than our thoughts. We may be identified with our mind, with our normal personality, but there's something within us which is much greater than that. And sometimes it may happen here on earth, in the physical, that that greater, that forgotten vastness gets unveiled. We get a vision of that higher knowing and that greatness that we've forgotten. And wonderful, memorable sentence, just the fact of living, to live and to love, these are signs of infinite things, things that are really permanent, eternal, and never-ending. Hmm? Love is a glory from eternity's spheres. It comes from the higher levels, high, very highest levels of existence. Comes here and expresses itself in us, in our bodies, as well as it can. Suresh. A based. A based is pillar most mocked. Mocked by other mind. That still is name and shape and is Ecstasy. Ecstasy. He is still the Godhead by which all can change. Will you read two more lines? Uh, my, my mystery, mystery. A mystery. Death in our unconscious stuff. Uh, please is all that can remain our life. Yes. So love is a glory that comes from the very highest levels of existence. Here he gets abased, brought low, and disfigured. 
he, here it's not expressed in its pure shape. There's some distortion, some change comes. It's as if he is being made fun of when we mock somebody, we imitate him in, a, in an ugly sort of way. No? So he says, here on earth there are lower powers, baser mites that steal the name of love and the shape and even the ecstasy, the delight of love. No? In, in our human lives we have this experience. The, the love wakes in us but then the way that it gets expressed it's distorted, disfigured by the base, these baser mites. But Sri Aurobindo says, even so, even then, he is still the Godhead by which all can change, transforms everything. Has the, love has the power to transform everything. And when we fall in love, we feel that, no? a mystery, something marvelous and wonderful wakes up in our inconscient stuff, in the insensitive stuff of our bodies and we experience a bliss, an intense delight that can remake our life, it can change our life completely. You were hiding away at the back there and I didn't see you. Are you going to read the next uh, beautiful passage for us? Hmm? Love dwells in us like an unopened flower, awaiting a rapid moment of the soul. Or he roams in his charmed sleep with thoughts and things. The child God is of clay. He seeks himself in many hearts and minds and living thoughts. He lingers for a sign that he can know. And when he comes, he wakes blindly to a voice, a look, a touch, <coughs> the meaning of a face. Mm, thank you. Beautiful. So it's as if love is living in us always sleeping like an unopened flower, a bud that's there waiting to open. And it's waiting some sudden moment of the soul hmm, that will wake it up. In the fairy stories it happens when the, the prince comes and kisses the sleeping princess no, and she wakes up. Or there he is roaming about in his sleep, his enchanted sleep, sleep walking amid the thoughts of the mind and the things of life. He's at play. Actually what he's looking for is himself. He seeks himself. He's looking <laughs> for himself in all these different hearts and minds that he meets on his journey, these different living forms. And what he's waiting for is that special sign. He he's linger, lingers, he's waiting for a sign that he can know, something that he recognizes. And when, when it comes, when that sign that he's been waiting for comes, he suddenly wakes up blindly just at the sound of a voice, or a look, or a touch, or the meaning of a face, as Satyavan sees Savitri's face. It's full of significance for him. His instrument, the dim corporeal mind of celestial insight, now forgetful grown, he seizes on some sign of outward charm to guide him mid the throng of nature's hints. Reads heavenly truths into earth's semblances. 
desires the image for the Godhead's sake, divines the immortalities of form and takes the body for the sculptured soul. So that love that's living within us is waiting for the sign and he has to use our physical mind, our dim corporeal mind that's not very sensitive to these things. It has f forgotten, it's grown forgetful of the celestial insight that it had, that the soul had on the higher levels. So, love seizes on some sign of outward charm, something, some outward sign of beauty, a look, a touch, the meaning of a face. Um, these outward signs remind him, you know? these are what guide him amid all this throng, the crowd of all the hints of nature. Nature is always speaking of love in some way or another. You know? But he, he's looking for that special sign. And when he sees some uh, sign of outward charm like that, he reads those heavenly truths into Earth's semblances, these appearances of Earth. So then he wakes up and he desires the image, the earthly form, because of the divine being, the divine soul that's within it. He desires the image for the Godhead's sake. And he divines, this means he guesses, he gets an intuition of the immortalities of form, the immortal beauty that just gets expressed imperfectly in earthly forms. And he falls in love with the body for the sake of that perfectly sculptured <coughs> soul that's dwelling within. Um, so, Gumsun, yeah? Love's adoration like a mystic scene. Through vision looks at the invisible. In all sister alphabets finds a godlike sense. But the mind only thinks, Behold the one for whom my life has waited long on dear. Behold the sudden subreason of my days. Yes. So that power of love within us is like a mystic seer who can look through the forms, through vision, looks at what is invisible. You know? And so through looking at the invisible, through the outer form, it can find a divine meaning in this alphabet, this limited number of signs that the physical can use. No? He sees the meaning behind. But the mind interprets that. It, uh, the, 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 the knowledge that love, the, the, divide, the, the soul's love has, the mind says, oh, look, here is the one. This is the one I've been waiting for. This is the one my life has, it makes me feel my life has been empty. And now at last, this is the person. This is the person who's going to rule my life from now on. So then the, the body tries to express this feeling, Dana Lakshmi. Heart feels for heart, limb cries for answering limb. All strives to enforce the unity, all is. Too far from the divine, love seeks his truth, and life is blind, and the instruments deceive, and powers are there, 
that labor to debase. Still can the mission come, the joy arrives. Yes. So when we fall in love at first sight like that, the heart feels for the other heart, the limbs of the body want to embrace each other, everything wants to enforce the unity, the oneness, the oneness that actually is there all the time in everything. And now here we are in separate bodies, we fall in love, we want to express that feeling of oneness as much as possible. But love is trying to seek his truth of oneness too far from the divine in our earthly life. And our life powers are blind. And the instruments, our, our powers of perception deceive us. And there are powers that are there, uh, vital powers, that want to spoil this thing and make it into something lower. But nevertheless, that vision can come and that joy can happen. Still can the vision come, the joy arrive. A ray of the cup, fit for love's nectar wine. As rare the vessel that can hold God's birth, the soul made ready through a thousand years is the living mold of the supreme descent. Mm. So love is like a, a wine of divinity, no? but it's rare that it finds a cup, a vessel that is really fit to hold it. Mm. And uh, you remember at the very beginning we read uh, Sri Aurobindo's first description of Savitri. And there he said, um, uh, well might he, might love, find in her his perfect shrine because she had all the qualities to be able to, to hold uh, not only earthly love but divine love. So that's very rare, and it's as rare as the vessel, as the cup, the, the body that can contain the birth of the divine himself, can become an avatar. No. For that, a soul needs to be made ready through a thousand years. This becomes the living mold of a supreme descent. So that's the end of Sri general statement about love in this uh, canto. He, he returns in the last few lines to the story. We'll, we'll take that up next week. So let's, let's read together. We go back to the beginning, line 147. And Satyavan looked out from his soul's doors and felt the enchantment of her liquid voice fill his youth's purple ambience and endured the haunting miracle of a perfect face. Mastered by the honey of a strange flower mouth, drawn to soul spaces opening round a brow, he turned to the vision like a sea to the moon and suffered a dream of beauty and of change discovered the aureole round a mortal's head 
adored a new divinity in things. His self-bound nature foundered as in fire. His life was taken into another's life. The splendid, lonely idols of his brain fell prostrate from their bright sufficiencies as at the touch of a new infinite to worship a Godhead greater than their own. An unknown, imperious force drew him to her. Marvelling he came across the golden sward. Gaze met close gaze and clung in sight's embrace. A visage was there noble and great and calm, as if encircled by a halo of thought, a span, an arch of meditating light, as though some secret nimbus half was seen. Her inner vision still remembering new a forehead that wore the crown of all her past, two eyes, her constant and eternal stars, comrade and sovereign eyes that claimed her soul, lids known through many lives, large frames of love. He met in her regard his future's gaze, a promise and a presence and a fire, saw an embodiment of aeonic dreams, a mystery of the rapture for which all yearns in this world of brief mortality, made in material shape his very own. This golden figure given to his grasp hid in its breast the key of all his aims a spell to bring the immortal's bliss on earth, to mate with heaven's truth our mortal thought, to lift earth hearts nearer the eternal's sun. In these great spirits, now incarnate here, love brought down power out of eternity to make of life his new undying base. His passion surged away from fathomless deeps. It leaped to earth from far forgotten heights, but kept its nature of infinity. On the dumb bosom of this oblivious globe, although as unknown beings we seem to me, our lives are not aliens, nor as strangers join. Move to each other by a causeless force. 
The soul can recognize its answering soul across dividing time and on life's roads absorbed rapt traveler turning it recovers familiar splendors in an unknown face and touched by the warning finger of swift love it thrills again to an immortal joy wearing a mortal body for delight. There is a power within that knows beyond our knowings. We are greater than our thoughts and sometimes earth unveils that vision here. To live, to love, are signs of infinite things. Love is a glory from eternity spheres. Abased, disfigured, mocked by baser mites that steal his name and shape and ecstasy. He is still the Godhead by which all can change. A mystery wakes in our inconscient stuff. A bliss is born that can remake our life. Love dwells in us like an unopened flower awaiting a rapid moment of the soul. Or he roams in his charmed sleep mid thoughts and things. The child God is at play. He seeks himself in many hearts and minds and living forms. He lingers for a sign that he can know. And when it comes, wakes blindly to a voice, a look, a touch, the meaning of a face. His instrument, the dim corporeal mind, of celestial insight now forgetful grown, He seizes on some sign of outward charm to guide him mid the throng of nature's hints, reads heavenly truths into earth's semblances, desires the image for the Godhead's sake, divines the immortalities of form and takes the body for the sculptured soul. Love's adoration, like a mystic seer, through vision looks at the invisible. In earth's alphabet finds a godlike sense. But the mind only thinks, Behold the one for whom my life has waited long unfilled. Behold the sudden sovereign of my days. Heart feels for heart, limb cries for answering limb. All strives to enforce the unity all is. Too far from the divine, love seeks his truth, and life is blind, and the instruments deceive, and powers are there that labor to debase. Still can the vision come 
the joy arrive. Rare is the cup fit for love's nectar wine, as rare the vessel that can hold God's birth. A soul made ready through a thousand years is the living mold of a supreme descent.